Greetings, Greenhouse people. We are back at it with another episode of Tech on Demand, brought to you by the fine folks at Grower Talks Magazine. If you don't receive Grower Talks and Green Profit every month, head on over to growertalks.com and subscribe. The magazine has been a pillar of the industry for more than 75 years, so it's about time you join the club. And speaking of subscribing, be sure to subscribe to the Tech on Demand podcast on your favorite podcast app, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, Odyssey, and just about every other one. Once you subscribe, you will never miss an episode. Oh, and one more thing. If you like the podcast, please consider leaving a positive review, because that really helps our algorithms. I'm your host, Bill Calkins, and this time, we've got a lot to cover with my guest. That means you'll need to listen all the way to the end because he shares critical info throughout the entire show. Today, I'm super pumped to be joined by J.C. Chong from CPRO. J.C. is a trusted expert when it comes to greenhouse and nursery pests. You might recognize his name. He's written for Grower Talks Plenty and is the editor of our Pest Talks newsletter. He's also presented at industry events and may have even been your college professor. Which brings me to J.C.'s bio. Dr. Chong is the Technical Development Manager at CPRO, recently taking that position after an extensive academic career that includes a BS in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from the University of Arizona, graduate training at the University of Georgia, post-doctoral training at the University of Florida, and a professorship at Clemson University. With more than 15 years in the turf and ornamental industry, He's now leading CPRO's ornamental R&D program. His goal? Deliver innovative solutions to complex problems. JC is known for his expertise in insect and mite pest management and has made significant contributions to the industry, with many more to come. It's going to be fun picking his brain about pesticide rotation, current pests on his radar, and ways to optimize your plant health. Without further ado, let's get into the episode. JC, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Bill. I'm, I've am i been excited for this conversation for a while because, well, frankly, we both are newsletter editors for Ball Publishing. I have read your newsletter, every one that you've put out, and I really appreciate your no-nonsense approach to pest management. comes across very clear in your writing style. I know it's uh, probably just coming from your, your personality and your long tenure of as a professor and working with students, it's really all about education and the identification and skills and everything that you put in the, in the newsletter is fantastic and very much needed by folks in the industry, including listeners of this podcast. Recently, you left the world of academia, uh, which I find interesting and joined CPRO as technical manager, which is pretty cool. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about your role and maybe how your transition uh, to CPRO is going? Yeah, I'll be glad to. Well, I am now the uh, technical manager uh, for CPRO in the uh, ornamental market. So a big part of my job is to develop new products uh, for the ornamental market. Not only that, but also, you know, improve on the product that, that we already have. For example, finding you new users or finding you new use site, uh, finding whether it works on some new pass, so on and so forth. And another big part of my job with CPRO is to be the uh, technical expert that support our technical expertise, uh, our team on the ground, uh, our distributors as well, and more importantly, uh, to help our growers uh, do a better job in managing their pests or controlling or using growth regulators and all that. Um, so uh, transition from the academia uh, to the industry has been very interesting, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Uh, but uh, in some way, I kind of explain it to some of my colleagues as, you know, it's not that different from well, what I do at academia. I still do research. I still do extension. I still do teaching. The only difference is uh, I don't have uh, really um, any graduate students anymore. And I don't have to write grants. I don't have to write papers and so on and so forth. But the core of my mission is still the same, research extension. And really that's part of what I, what I, what I want to make, make the transition, which is um, I have always wanted to work with growers. 
And that gave me the greatest satisfaction to really uh, do that. And, you know, writing the newsletter is a great way to do it um, because I know that I'm talking to groups, but what I want to move in some way. I wanted to be able to get onto the ground to help the growers with their problem because oftentimes somebody can call you, they can describe, describe a problem and you don't know what that might be and you're not seeing the whole situation. So you may not come up with the best solution possible, right? So you kind of have to look at the environment, figure out what's wrong. Maybe the solution may be as simple as changing the temperature or changing the irrigation or something small like that. So um, I always wanted to be out there uh, to see those kind of stuff, to come up with the best solution possible. So this new job with CPRO really gave me the opportunity to, to do that. Um, so uh, for the past few weeks, I, I've been with CPRO for about three months now. And for the past three months, I've visited quite a few growers. Uh, we have, I've gone to Southern Florida, uh, gone to Eastern Texas, uh, middle of Tennessee, uh, West Michigan, uh, and coming up, I'll be going to Louisiana, to uh, California Central Coast, and to Minnesota. So all those trips really is to uh, meet up with our technical expertise on the ground and also to visit growers and see what is going on, uh, to see what I can do to help them um, be more successful, uh, to uh, have a better operation. It's it sounds exciting, really, if you know being involved in everything from the development of products and even finding new uses for existing products. I bet, um, you know, as, as a researcher, that that's pretty exciting, but it really is, you know, our industry is about the people and being in the greenhouses. I would imagine that when you have a phone call with a grower, you get a tiny piece of the story, but when you're there in person, they're going to open up a lot more. And that's really where you can shine with, with the knowledge that you have and really, digging into those problems, working with the C pro team to, to bring the solutions. Um, and you know, that that's what everybody wants these days is help me solve my problems so that I can grow the best crops with the fewest losses and, and really move on to the next season. So, yeah, absolutely. Oftentimes, like you say, a lot of those details, um, or the concern, um, or the problem may not come through in a phone call or in an email. Um, it's a lot easier to talk about it in person. You see them in the face, they tell you what is going on in the face, and you can see it with your eyes what is going on. Um, that is a lot of information that can really help uh, tone down what in the world is happening and you know, what can be done about it. It's true. And you know, you've been already traveled to a lot of different states and seen a lot of different operations. It sounds like uh, CPRO didn't want you sitting at, sitting at a desk they really wanted well, you to hit the ground that's running. That's not why they hire me, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is really, I mean, that's a perfect way to start any any sort of new career adventure, in my opinion, is to get out there and you know meet with your own team as well as, well as customers. So in those travels and interactions with growers um, and, and nursery folks around, you know, all in th all those states that you visited, what are you, what are you seeing and hearing out there, I guess, this, uh, this spring and summer and Maybe, I guess, just to add a bit of context for the listeners, it is July 2023, so it's hot. And you've been traveling a lot in states where there's uh, all sorts of production going on. So what are, you, what are you seeing and hearing out there? Oh, Bill, it's hot out there. I mean, I'm sitting in my home office in Florida, South Carolina. And right now is, what, uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and it is 92 degrees out there. <laughs> so it's hot, and it's really humid. And that's something that we are seeing quite a bit this year, which is the fluctuation in temperature and weather is tremendous. Um, so uh, some of the sales are kind of delayed. And then when it actually hits the ground running, it really goes. So folks are really scrambling quite a bit. And with all that temperature and humidity changes, of course, it brings up a lot of uh, pest management problem as well. Um, but I travel to different parts of the state and a different part of the country, actually, and I see different things, really. And it seems like folks in different parts of the countries are worrying about different things and they are facing different kind of challenges. Um, for example, you know, uh, last week, well, before Cultivate, um, I was actually in Tennessee, in near Menville area. And folks there, the one major thing they're talking about is the uh, vascular streak dieback. Mm -hmm. And that's really major issues that they're dealing with. Uh, for uh, nurseries in Tennessee. 
as well as folks in uh, North Carolina as well. Um, so those are what people are dealing with. And when I was in Michigan, a lot of growers are talking about aphids. Um, and spider mite is sort of quiet this year or this spring, um, but I think that's probably going to change as we keep having a high temperature. And I think this summer we're going to see quite a bit of spider mites starting to really raise their ugly heads down the road. Um, but the one thing that folks everywhere I go, the one thing that everybody talk about is uh, thrips. Everybody's talking about thrips, different thrips. Um, for a lot of states, Michigan, and also in uh, Texas as well, folks are really worried about uh, Western flower thrips. Most of what they are seeing is Western flower thrips. But folks there are also worried about another new invasive thrips, uh, thrips poppy spinus. Mm -hmm. People might know it as uh, pepper thrips or ta Taiwanese thrips and different kind of uh, common names to it. Uh, but typically, you know, when I, because there's not really a uh, standardized common name, we're just going to call it thrips, poppy spinous. Um, but anyway, the, like I say, that's a new invasive thrips. It's definitely in Florida, causing a lot of problem in Florida this spring. Uh, right now, it's kind of on the trough, I guess you can call it. It's not. Uh, there's not that many issues with it right now, but I think when it comes fall, uh, we're probably going to see another peak in the thrips activity. And that's, you know, 16 years uh, working in uh, uh, ornamental entomology, I've seen a lot of things, and thrips is one of those things that we typically see a lot of them in the spring and then a lot of them in the fall. Um, and so I expect, similarly, uh, for thrips, poppy spiders, probably we're going to see a, another peak in the fall as well. Um, what, so, is, what is it about fall that, that makes you think that? Is it is it climate? Is it just the number of products being shipped? I, I think it has a lot to do with what is going on around the greenhouse and the nursery. Uh, thrips, they are polyphagous, meaning that they can feed on a lot of different plant species. Mm -hmm. And so something that we have seen with uh, parvispinus in, in, in Florida, and this is my guessing, uh, we see a lot of them in the spring. And that usually associated with spring flowers blooming. And uh, when the flowers is there, there's built up a huge thrips population. And when those flowers got uh, senesce or when they got mold, the thrips had to go somewhere, mm. right? So, and then they're gonna take to the air and fly everywhere and then you ended up having a lot of thrips in the in the nursery. So another peak when it comes to flowering is going to be in the fall, and that's why we're going. To, I expect us, us to see another peak in the fall as well. So when the wildflowers blooming again or fruit trees uh, blooming again, we're probably going to see a lot of thrips. This is going to build up another population. When those flowers are gone, the thrips has to go somewhere. That makes sense. That that makes sense, and I think. Um, like you said, it is on the minds of a lot of people in the industry. It got a lot of press uh, earlier this uh, this year in the, in the spring. Um, and I definitely uh, would would advocate for our listeners to go and find resources on the Thrips Parvospinus. University of Florida has done a really good job. Uh, Ontario Ministry of Ag has done a really good job. Um, but But there's research ongoing right now into... All sorts of control methods, um, conventional and biological. It's um, it's something that that's getting a lot of attention in the in the universities, um, and I'm sure it's something that that the the team at CPRO has been looking at too, right? Yeah, you... ab absolutely. So you know, we work quite closely with growers in Florida, try to figure out a solution, and we also work with researchers in the University of Florida and and try to you know improve the management approach for sure. And some of our product actually fit very well uh, in the in the uh, management program for thrips poppy spinus, and it would be something that uh, listeners or growers in in the rest of the country should probably pay attention to, simply because um, you know we do ship plants around quite a bit, so there's a pretty good chance that the thrips might end up on your doorstep one of these days. So. You know, visit those resources. Definitely visit the uh, resources down in University of Florida learn how to identify those thrips and how to control them. And that probably get people ready and set up to actually um, uh, do something about it when the uh, thrips actually showed up. Okay, that's really good advice. And I'll put some of those links in the show notes as well um, 
for folks to, to click on. I know that the research is ongoing, but they keep being added to these, uh, these websites, which thank you. Cause you really gave me a good segue right there because the, you know, a, a big part of the conversation that, that we want to have today is about rotation and, you know, thrips are definitely a good case study for, for rotation um, and, and use of multiple products and codes as you uh, address pest concerns. But, you know, you, you mentioned rotation as a topic you really wanted to talk about. So why don't, um, you know, why don't we get into the reason why uh, rotation of pesticides and other products is important and, and maybe create somewhat of a, um, a sense of urgency for our for our listeners and uh, to get some attention to the importance of rotation. Sure. Well, before we talk about rotation, maybe we should start with, you know, um, what is pesticide resistance? Mm -hmm. So rotation really is one way to delay the development of pesticide resistance, right? So pesticide resistance in the most simple sense, if I'm going to explain it to my mother, it's going to be something like, okay, I spray a pesticide on a pest, I used the pesticide before, it worked before, and now I use it, it doesn't work anymore. So in some way, that is a loss of sensitivity, and more severely, it becomes a, a, a resistant problem. So basically, resistant is, you know, a pest that you try to control with a product that, you, that works before, and now it doesn't. Very simple sense is that. But there's a lot of myths uh, associated with, with, uh, with uh, resistant, oh, uh, of course. So one thing I want to mention is that, you know, uh, let's just say resistance happens 20 miles down the road, mm. another operation 20 miles down the road. And it doesn't mean that you are going to get resistance as well. So resistance is more or less a local issue in some way, but the chance of that spreading is pretty good because like I say, we ship plants all over the place. So if one operation actually created a resistant population, by shipping those plants that is infested with those resistant uh, pests around, they are basically spreading that resistant, right? So a lot of time you cannot do, you cannot, you cannot really stop what everybody else is doing in their own, own operation. So you can only look at what you are doing and do the best job um, possible. So again, uh, one way to do that is really rotation. Uh, to develop a rotation program so that the uh, pest population is always being challenged by something different so that they never have an opportunity to develop uh, resistance or tolerance for one particular product. So keep challenging them, using different things to challenge them. They never get used to it. And that's basically the sense of it. So you ask why is rotation very important? Well, that's well, you know, a few reasons for that. And the most important reason is it is very expensive to the growers, it's very expensive to the pesticide manufacturers, and ultimately is very, very expensive to consumers. Uh, so here's what how, how I would explain it, okay? So it's expensive to a grower simply because if you have a pest population that you cannot manage, you have to use a higher rate or you have to use a more expensive product or you have to spray more often that means that your cost is going to go up, right? So it's expensive to a grower for that. And it's also expensive to a grower reputationally. Uh, so if everybody knows that you're shipping out resistant population, that's probably not good for your business. Um, and it's expensive to pesticide manufacturer or developers simply because, um, you know, uh, we're in the business of making money, to be honest. So we want our product to be used for a longer period of time so that we can continue to generate revenue. And if somebody being ir irresponsible used the product inappropriately, created the resistant population, and now we cannot use that product anymore, well, that's lo loss of revenue, right? So that's expensive. And like I say, ultimately, it's going to be expensive to the consumers because they are going to be the one who is going to end up paying for a third population that cannot be controlled uh, a pest population that is very expensive to control and loss of any kind of uh, pest management too. So ultimately, the customer has to pay the price. And, you know, you talked about manufacturers, you know, it, it, it impact in the bottom line of manufacturers, which then circles right back to the grower, because if, 
when 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 you guys have to develop new products they you know there there's a cost that has to get passed along so oh, absolutely um, absolutely so think about it anytime there's a new product being developed the estimate has always been that it takes about 10 years 10 to 25 million dollars to develop that one pesticide so it is a very expensive thing and of course, you know, the developer probably want to recoup that money. Mm -hmm. How do they recoup it? They're probably going to raise the price on something else. So like you say, eventually it's going to hurt the growers uh, just by being, increasing the cost. For sure. And, you know, you mentioned the fact that we do ship products around and move those resistant pests around. And it's always a good reminder. Talk to your suppliers, you know, the folks that you're getting, you know, liners and plugs from and, and inputs from and find out what they are spraying on those crops before they come to your loading dock because they all keep records and they're happy to share what those crops have been treated with. Um, so that, so that, you know, and you can, you know, you can approach the crop, uh, with that information. So I always like to, to recommend that something we hear repeated and something that's always worth repeating. Right. And that is a, that's an excellent recommendation because some of what we're going to talk about, which is, you know, how do we build a rotation program kind of built into that um, particular particular recommendation as well so let's 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 go ahead and move move on to that um you know we we discussed the why uh so we've kind of set the set the, set the base or foundation of the discussion but you know i really want to spend some time on the how because rotation can seem i think like a puzzle and the reason i say that is because there are so many charts and graphs and wall posters that talk about rotating, you know, the, the modes of action and all the codes involved. And it can seem, I think the first time you hear it, very challenging, but the fact that all those tools are available and a lot of research and knowledge um, from, from companies like CPRO and others have, have really been done, you know, even at the university level to put together, you know, very, I guess, vetted uh, rotation guidelines. Um, but I still think no matter what a grower's experience level is, it can seem very, uh, sort of magical how you, how you do all this. So can you share some basic tips or strategies, um, to help kind of demystify the, the whole process of rotation? I guess we don't have hours, but we have some time and I think it would be good to, to dig into that a little bit. Sure, absolutely. So um, when we talk about rotation, um, really what we're talking about is rotating among different mo modes of action. So what 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 is a mode of action? The way the way I think about it is that a mode of action of an insecticide is the way an insecticide actually kill a pest. Um, it could be chemical, it could be biological, it could be biochemical and all kinds of process. So for example, uh, let me just pick on say um, bifendrin, Calstar. Uh, it's a very ubiqu ubiquitous, a lot of people using it. So bifendrin or Calstar is what we call a, uh, um, basically is a, uh, is a neurotoxin. So the way they work is actually focusing on one of the specific molecule or pathway within the uh, within the insect nervous system, <clears throat> just to basically knock it out of function. And when it's out of function, then the insect's not gonna perform normally, they just might die, <clears throat> they might start moving, all kinds of things happen. So uh, mode of action is what, what, what we're talking about. Uh, so when we talk about rotation, we're rotating among different mode of action, not among different trade names. Right. For example, um, some of the product could have a lot of different trade names. So I'm going to pick on bifenthrin again. Uh, bifenthrin has been around for a long time. There's a lot of generics. There's a lot of trade names out there. One of the one folks talk about um, using using quite a bit is Taustar. Taustar is one of the trade names. And then Upstar, that's another trade name. Um, and then Bifen, that's another trade name. Right. So all these trade names, it doesn't matter how different they sound. They're all the same active ingredient. And the active ingredient, if it's the same, then it has the same mode of action. So when we talk about rotation, we always do that, talk about mode of action. Uh, in insecticide alone, we have about 39, maybe more mode of action now. So it's just about impossible for even somebody that does it for a living like myself 
to remember all 39 different modes of action. So um, there's an easy way to do it. Um, so there's a committee called the Insecticide Action, uh, Insecticide Resistant Action Committee, IRAC. Uh, you probably heard of that before. So IRAC is a committee that look at all the insecticide, classify them, put them in different mode of action, and then they assign each mode of action a specific number. And within that number, you may have different chemical classes. Then the chemical classes are given a letter. Um, for example, you know, um, let's just say uh, carbaryl. Carbaryl or seven uh, is one B, a uh, one A, and uh, um, acephate or orthine is one B. So when you look at that, one A, one B, one meaning that they have the same mode of action. A and B means they are different classes. So. Is carbaryl and acephate the same thing? No, they are not the same thing, but they are the same mode of action, right? So the number kind of tell you uh, what the mode of action is. And to make it even easier, most of the uh, insects I label now actually have those IRAC number printed um, pretty prominently on the first page, on the top right corner of the uh, insects I label. So every time you pick up a bottle, you look at the first page, that number is right in your face. So you can't miss it. So even if you don't remember all 39 mode of action, that is okay. Because if you know the number, then you can develop a, a rotation program. So I would make several, I have several tips about building a rotation program. So the first thing is of course, uh, rotate among different mode of action or meaning that you want to rotate among different number meaning that uh, the first application, for example, if you use first application, you spray something that's a number one, and then the next one, you don't want to use another one. You want to use a different number, for example, three. And then the next one, you use a different number, four. So you, you go from one, three to four, and that is a rotation program right there if you use different IRAC number. Okay, so a lot of time folks ask me, okay, well, you just say three product or three mode of action. So how many of those mode of action do I need in a program? I usually say at least three. Two is not a rotation back and forth. No, that's not a rotation. So you want to have at least three. And, you know, if you can have four, great. If you want to put in five, sure, why not? If you have that many product, absolutely. So, you know, at the, at the minimum, three that would be one of my recommendation as well. And another recommendation, the recommendation I would make is uh, try to start your rotation program with the most effective product against the particular life stage that you are dealing with. Um, for example, if you are dealing with uh, say spider mite, right? So if you are in a liner and most of the spider mite that you found on the liners are either nymphs or eggs, so what you want to do with that really is to use a in uh, microbe regulators. Just spray that, and then it will kill the nymph. It will kill the eggs, right? So you start with the most uh, most uh, effective product for that particular life stage. And another recommendation I would really make is you want to think about um, the generation time of your pest as well. So you don't really need to rotate from one to the next. Um, very, very quickly. What I typically recommend is you use the same mode of action for one pest generation. Um, meaning that, well, if you have a spider mite population, we know that spider mite complete that development in about one to two weeks. And if you just gonna spray, um, if you want to make application twice a week, meaning that the two application that you have are dealing with the same generation, then those two uh, application can be the same mode of action number or IRAC number. But if you're dealing with something that's a little bit longer um, growing, then you know you might have to use, uh, you can just rotate it to a different mode of action each time. So I uh, think about the generation time as well. And uh, that would really be depending on, that would determine uh, how frequently you can reapply and what uh, IRAC number you should be using. Great advice. You know, if you, your rotation is is at least three, I think that's uh, that's uh, a good baseline. Uh, if you can use four, even better. If there's five, 
go for it, but really understand the life stage of the past that you are targeting. And uh, I, I, that was really good advice about using, you can use that same mode of action within that specific life stage, but then you're going to want to start rotating if, if that uh, gets longer. Um, really, really good advice, good kind of a big picture view of rotation. It's about as clearly as I've ever heard it explained, which I, th- which I appreciate and I know the listeners appreciate. Um, let's dig a little bit deeper. Uh, when, when a grower comes to you about developing a rotation, because I assume it's fairly specific, uh, to their organization and, and, or their operation and set of challenges that they're dealing with, how do you begin? And, and where do you, I guess, if you're working with their team, what are some, some resources you tend to direct them to? Um, even, you know, even as a professor, I know that you were probably teaching a lot of your students about the importance of rotation. What are, what are some good resources, but I guess start with how, how you start working with a grower to build a, a, a solid kind of customized rotation program. Okay, Bill. So I'm an entomologist. So what I'm going to talk about here is just going to be focusing on insect side. And of course, there are a lot of resources out there as well um, for folks that is more concerned with disease and also with weed. There are a lot of guide about uh, fungicide or herbicide out there. So I recommend everybody out there to look for it. And the first source, of course, I would go to the extension service uh, for real. Um, They have a lot of uh, good recommendation and good services that they can provide. And on the insect side realm, um, I think CPRO has a good uh, resource for everybody. Um, I just recently developed a uh, insect site poster. And that particular poster, you can actually access it online at uh, www.cpro.com slash bug poster, B-U-G-P-O-S-T-E-R, bug poster. So when you get on that, you can download that poster for free. You can print it out. You can stick it on your wall and whatever you want to. So the poster uh, has two sides to them. Uh, One side is uh, a listing of all the insect site that is registered to control some of the major pests that we have in greenhouse and ornamentals. So um, let's just say uh, I'm dealing with thrips today. All right, so I can just go to that poster, look under the column for thrips, just kind of trace it down. And then I'm going to know all the insect side that's actually over, actually active ingredient that is registered for it uh, for greenhouse and nursery use. So that's a very quick reference that somebody can use. And one good thing about that poster is I also listed the IRAC number and also the uh, REI and U site on that poster. So, you know, people can find those information very, very quickly. So let's just say they can just look at that poster and then can, they can look at the storage and see what they have that is on that list and put together a, uh, a spray program or rotation program, pretty easy. So uh, that's one way to do it. But to make it even easier, on the back side of the poster, I actually have very specific, um, how would I put it, recommendations uh, for rotation program. Okay, so folks can just uh, look at that. And so, for example, you know, um, this is one example uh, from the back. Let's just say white flies. Um, let's just say a grower in greenhouse, they have white fly problem. And what is my recommended uh, rotation program, which is uh, marathon followed by talus, followed by mainspring, followed by rycar. That would be my rotation program. And just in case that a grower uh, cannot use neonicotinoid, uh, which is marathon, in their operation, we also have the option of choosing non-neonic rotation program. And in this case, for white flies would be contos and talus and mainspring and rycar. And we also have a rotation program for outdoors. So if you look at the backside of that poster, you basically have um, the rotation program for just some of the major pests. Um, in different situation, in situation uh, where you can use neonic, in situation where you cannot use neonic, and for situation where you can use it on outdoor nursery. So I think that it would be a very good uh, resource for anybody uh, who is interested in digging deep into developing a rotation program, for sure, uh, just to download their poster, take a look at that. 
No, that's perfect. And again, I will put that link in the show notes for anybody who wants to check it out. I looked at it. It makes sense to me and I'm not a grower. So if it makes sense to me, it's going to make a lot more sense to you. And uh, and I know that that, that you and your team worked uh, really hard on putting that together, JC, and it's a fantastic uh, resource. Um, yeah, it, it's great to see it's great to see resources like that uh, coming out that are easy to use and easy to access and uh, can hopefully uh, set people up and point them in the right direction. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, when, when you start working with a grower and you guys come up with a rotation program together, what is your experience, um, I guess, in, in how closely folks tend to follow those rotations? And then some of the outcomes that they can expect. Is it a, is it something where you need to to trial and error? Is it something that seems more, you know, more straightforward and they they tend to work? I guess when when do you have to go back and reassess? Well, that's a good question. So I would, you know, like I say, I I would give a recommendation about rotation program, and oftentimes those rotation program are built based on what the grower's concern may be and what I know is going to work. Um, but sometimes that may not pans out to work that great. <laughs> so oftentimes we might just have to come back to a drawing board. And oftentimes the grower just come back to me and say, hey, JC, it's really not working as much as well as I would like it to be. Let's think about some, let's go back to the drawing board and try to do that. So, and that's something that pretty easy to do. And in fact, oftentimes, the experience of the grower also come into play. Maybe they have tried a particular product that works great for me, but not working out so great for them. And in this case, that product can come out from my rotation program and put in something else that actually works for them. So what I whatever I'm recommending, recommending, recommending is not fixed in stone. Uh, we can think about the experience, we think about the situation, whether something is going to work or not. And we also need to think about whether they're using biological control or not, because some of the uh, some of the product may not be compatible with biocontrol agents that they are using or phytotoxicity issues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we also uh, want to think about. So oftentimes it is a two-way street in some way. Uh, I make a recommendation they think about it, try it, whether it works or not, and then they come back and we just just keep working on it until we get to something that everybody is happy and is effective. Right. Because effective is is what we're all shooting for. And you know, it's that that collaboration that I think makes um, companies like C Pro so valuable to your customers is that you will work with the grower until you get it right. Um and it and, and that's a then that's a big reason for why I leave academia to join the industry. For really sure. is to be able to provide that sort of support that kind of help um, and have time to actually do that. That's awesome. And I know it is, it's very much appreciated. So as we're wrapping up, I can't let you get off the call until we talk a little bit about Thrips Parvus I don't feel so bad because you brought it up. Um, so you opened the door, but since I've got uh, insect and pest expert, on the podcast, we've got to dig into this a little bit deeper. So, and the fact that you spent some years in Florida and you know the southern region so well, uh, we got it. We got to talk a little bit about Thrips parvospinus. Um, and you already mentioned that you've been talking to growers about it. So, do you have any, I guess, general thoughts on the on the past or um, some specific ideas for how to how to control it if and when it does pop up again this fall and then probably again next spring. Sure. So right now, parvispinus basically sucks up all the oxygen in the mm -hmm. room in some way, especially for growers in Florida that is really worried about it. Uh, it may not it may not be received very well, but I'm going to say it anyway, uh, which is that the way I look at thrips parvispinus is that, you know, it is really not that different from Western flower thrips or chili thrips. Um, what I mean by that is that it is not the death nail. Their susceptibility, they are susceptible to a lot of insecticide that we have already, and they're likely susceptible to a lot of biological control options that we may have. 
Um, a lot of folks are working on it. A lot of folks are coming up with solution. My job is to put those solutions together and provide the best recommendation. And so what I'm saying is this, which is that don't get nervous because um, we have solutions. We can deal with this, not a problem. Uh, we just have to have a little bit more patience, um, use the best tool that we have. I think we can handle this. Um, that, is, that, is not, uh, that is not difficult, I don't think. Excellent. I'm glad you said that. I'm going to uh, I'm definitely gonna gonna share that message because it is it's different than we've heard. I think um, from some of the trade media, us included, is that you know this is a a, a big issue. Um, but then again, like you said, we've learned that we do have products to deal with this and uh, a lot of research going on. So I really think that's that's good to hear. Um, any specific products from CPRO you think are, are going to be valuable in the, in the battle against Thrips Parvus Spinus? Yes, absolutely. So the one product that we have, Haji Haji SC, uh, has been tested uh, in Florida by uh, Dr. Alexandra Lavinti to be one of the uh, uh, most effective product against uh, Thrips Parvus Spinus. Um, she also tested quite a few other products as well. So there are some other products that actually works quite well against parvi spinous. Um, so to make it easier for everybody to actually control thrips parvi spinous and also develop rotation programs for that, um, I recently wrote a uh, rotation guide for this particular thrips species. And folks can actually access the uh, rotation guide for free uh, by going to uh, www.cpro.com slash thrips and it would bring them directly to that particular document. So within that document, uh, I have rotation program for adults and rotation program for NIMS of the thrips, and also a combined rotation program for both the adults and NIMS. Just depends on what everybody is seeing, depending on life stages. And I also have a rotation program for greenhouse, rotation program for nurseries. Um, so that's it should cover just about everybody's wants in some way. And the rotation programs are built with data from uh, Dr. Lovinti uh, in her research. So we know that this particular product actually works and works well against thrips poppy spinous. So I will encourage everybody, if you are dealing with thrips poppy spinous, or if you think you might want to you know, develop a program for it just in case, uh, to go to this particular website, download that uh, rotation guide. Uh, I hope that would be uh, very useful for everybody. That's great. I definitely encourage the listeners to download the guide, even if you haven't seen this particular thrips in your greenhouse or nursery yet. It's a good one to have on file. Uh, make sure your team knows where it is. And uh, hopefully you can you can get out ahead of this thing if you end up seeing them uh, this fall or next spring. Thank you so much. Before we get off this call, um, I definitely want to ask you uh, if there's anything that we missed. Um, you know, is there anything you want to reiterate? Uh, is there anything that I should have asked that I didn't? Um, what, uh, what what can you share with the listeners? Any sort of final thoughts before before we wrap it up today, JC? Well, I guess I'll just say one thing or re reiterate one thing, which is that there is a right way to put together a rotation program that, but there is not a perfect rotation program um, because each rotation program should be developed based on everybody else's particular circumstance. And anybody really can develop a rotation program based on some of the tips that we talk about today. So, but the most important thing to me is kind of like the old Nike slogan, you know, just do it. Mm -hmm. Just do the rotation. And that is very important things to do. Last but not least, JC, if listeners want to reach out to you or any of the experts at CPRO, where can they find that information? Well, the best place to start is to visit, visit CPRO's Ornament Solution website uh, at www.cpro.com. Uh, when you open up the web page, you'll be able to see who is the uh, technical specialist in your region and how to contact them. Uh, so, you know, feel free to contact us and chat with us. Uh, we'll be able to help you with any of the pests and disease 
or water quality or algae management or growth regulator questions that you may have. And if folks uh, want to contact me directly, <clears throat> please go ahead and click my click on my name on the uh, Pest Talk website, uh, Pest Talk newsletter, and then they will send me an email. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise. And I want to personally share my appreciation for Pest Talks uh, as an e-newsletter. I know it. I know it takes time to write a newsletter. I write one myself. Um, but every issue is that, that you write is so full of great information. Um, and I know it benefits the industry. I hear positive things about it every time I share it on social media. Gets a lot of likes, gets a lot of comments back. So uh, all of your hard work uh, is very much appreciated by the growers. And thank you very, very much. I will put a link to Pest Talks in the show notes as well. Um, again, thank you so much, JC. I appreciate your time. You're welcome, Bill. And I'm Bill Calkins with Tech On Demand, reminding you to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app like iTunes, Spotify, Google, Odyssey, Stitcher, just about all of them. That way you never miss an episode and jump back in the archives because I think there are now 70 episodes to check out uh, sharing useful information for greenhouse professionals of all types. So here's to a fantastic season. 